Thank you, Brett, and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Oren Miller. Uh, I'm located in uh, Los Angeles, but I formerly lived in Minnesota. Uh, and our webinar panelists for today uh, include myself uh, and Spark Burmaster, an electrical engineer and also a uh, certified building biology environmental consultant and electromagnetic radiation specialist in uh, western Wisconsin. Damon Coyne is a building biologist in St. Paul, Minnesota. Frank D. Christina is a building biologist in uh, Bloomington, a suburb of Minneapolis. And we've all taught for the Building Biology Institute. Shaley Olson is also with us. She's a building biologist in Minneapolis. And uh, her specialty is all aspects of construction uh, using the protocols that we have in our profession, including indoor air quality, non-toxic building materials, and water intrusion issues and avoidance of mold. So that's her area of expertise. We're going to be uh, informing you about the building biology profession. We, uh, we're going to be uh, going over the relationship between buildings and human health. That's what we focus on in building biology. The profession was founded in Germany in the 1970s, brought to this country by an architect by the name of Helmut Zia. He founded what he called the International Institute for Bow Biology and Ecology in Clearwater, Florida, but that was translated from the German to the English building biology. We are among 120 certified building biology environmental consultants in the US and Canada. And you can find us on the Find an Expert tab on the right uh, of their website, hbelc.org. And we have a new certification program for electromagnetic radiation specialists. And Helmut uh, passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. So we are very grateful for uh, him coming to this country and starting the profession here. The goals of our profession are to find and reduce sources of toxicity in the home or office. That includes indoor air quality, EMFs, outgassing of building materials. And we do that by strengthening people's tolerance, our clients' tolerance, to the toxic influences that are outside the home by reducing the exposure that we're exposed to inside the home when we're uh, home resting, uh, particularly at night in the sleeping environment, as well as the living and work environments during the day. There are four types of EMFs that we recognize in the building biology profession. AC electric fields, AC magnetic fields, they're both from house wiring and power lines, radio frequency EMFs, and dirty electricity. Uh, now, electric and magnetic field exposure is defined as the alternation of the polarity between positive and negative uh, for AC electricity on electric power lines, circuits in your walls, and power cords at 60 times per second for house wiring. The M in the EMF is the magnetic field component in the blue, the horizontal portion. The E is the electric field component that's vertical. And these fields uh, come off of power lines, circuits in your walls, and power cords uh, that are at right angles to each other. And they enter our living space and can affect your health. So the electric and magnetic fields are coupled in the far field, uh, which is where radio frequencies are, up at those frequencies. Uh, and the far field is defined as three wavelengths from the source. The near field, however, is within three wavelengths, and they're uncoupled, these electric and magnetic fields, from each other. Now, since wire, building wiring is uh, at 60 hertz, has a wavelength of 3,000 miles, we're always in the near field. So you have to measure both separately. And that's, that's why electric fields, for instance, are um, often ignored, because people are only looking at the magnetic fields with their Gauss meter. I'll talk about that more later. So for builders and architects and electrical contractors who are on this call, there are going to be two groups of people who will seek out, uh, seek your, um, your advice uh, and uh, your services for uh, these protocols that we're talking about in this webinar series. The first would be people who are themselves electrically hypersensitive or chemically sensitive, the chronically ill, infants, children, the elderly. And these are uh, uh, one group, and they comprise 70% of our clients. Then the other group would be health-conscious individuals. So it turns out that one-third of the population has health symptoms from the use of wireless devices, as an example, and exposure to electric and magnetic fields. But they don't even know that. And their doctors don't know that, at least not in this country. Wiring errors are present in one-third of homes, as an example. And they cause magnetic fields. Current on your water service supply pipe and grounding system uh, are, also causes magnetic fields. And that's found in many homes. So the, the way that we got uh, to this point and were invited by Brett uh, and the Green Home Institute to provide this webinar series is because when I lived in Minneapolis, I gave a lecture in 2007 on EMFs. Mm. Michael Anschell was there, and he's the co-founder of 
the Minnesota Green Store program, he invited me to provide a protocol for low EMF wiring in new and remodeled homes for the Minnesota Green Star program, which was just starting at that time. So I approached my teacher and colleague, uh, Spark Burmaster in Wisconsin, who grew up in Minneapolis, uh, and we uh, adapted the building biology new and remodeled residential low EMF wiring protocol that he wrote for our profession, and we provided that to the Green Star program, and that's in the innovation section of the certification program for the Green Star Homes uh, program. Uh, I was then invited to sit on the Minnesota Green Star Technical Committee from 2007 to 2009, and then when I left uh, Minneapolis to move to California in 2010, uh, Shaley Olson uh, took over and she's now on that committee. So the objectives of our seminar is to introduce you to EMFs and to the building biology profession, to identify sources of EMFs in the homes and buildings that you uh, design and build, to teach you what, how EMFs are produced by standard design and wiring practices that unfortunately builders use every day and do produce these fields, what the health risks are, uh, and also what the official stances of our government, the regulatory agencies here in industry, and how EMFs are handled outside the United States, which you'll find out is different than how it's handled here. You're going to learn low EMF design and wiring practices, and our ultimate goal is to reduce occupant exposure to EMFs in residential and commercial construction. Mm -hmm. So the webinar series is set up uh, as follows. There are six uh, uh, webinars in all. The first one is the one you're listening to now, uh, the introduction to EMFs. That will be followed uh, in January sometime uh, by a full hour on AC magnetic field EMFs. Then the next one after that will be uh, electric field EMFs that I'll pre uh, present. The third one uh, will be radio, or the fourth one will be radio frequencies. The next one will be a full hour devoted to dirty electricity EMFs, and then a follow-up uh, summary uh, wrap-up um, uh, webinar. Before we turn to the introduction to the specific types, I just want to mention that there is credible scientific research on these fields and their effect on human health, beginning with the International Commission for Electromagnetic Safety in Italy, the Swedish Association for the Electrosensitive, Power Watch in the United Kingdom, International EMF Alliance, and here in this country, we do have the Bioinitiative Working Group headed by Cindy Sage in Santa Barbara, just up the coast from where I live, and Professor David Carpenter at the University of Albany. And I highly recommend that you go to their website, bioinitiative.org, and look at what they've written. Uh, and finally, Dr. Uh, uh, Martin Blank, whose picture you see here, is a retired um, uh, physicist, I'm sorry, researcher at Columbia University, who's done pioneering research on the effects of uh, EMFs, particularly from wireless devices, cell phones and such, on DNA. And uh, he told me that he was a skeptic before he did the research, and now he is so uh, aware of this problem that he has gathered with 200 scientists from around the world, and in May of this year they approached the UN and the World Health Organization to say there's a health crisis uh, afoot here and you need to pay attention to this. So go to emfscientist.org. He's in Los Angeles today to petition the city council to have them stop introducing Wi-Fi on light poles all over the city because it will affect people's health. And finally, the French government just um, passed a law in January banning Wi-Fi in daycare centers and uh, nurseries for children under three because of the health effects that they see from the research that um, is, is available. So we're going to now go to a, a um, a brief summary of each of the four types. Uh, Spark Burmaster will talk about magnetic fields next. Then I'll follow on electric fields. Damon Coyne will speak about radio frequencies. And Frank DeCristina will uh, discuss dirty electricity. I'll be introducing each of these people between one to the other. And then we'll have a recap at the end and then questions and answers at the end. So, Brett, you can turn this over to uh, Spark. Thank you, Norm. Hi, hey, this is Mark Burmaster over here in uh, Western uh, Wisconsin, and let's see, I'll go to the next one. To... Okay, I clicked on there. It's supposed to go. There it is. All right. So then, this is sort of my. Uh, I, I like it uh, that there's one diagram that summarizes everything, and this is my one di one page diagram summarizing the whole electromagnetic exposure issue. And so what we're going to do here is give you a 10-minute, I'm going to give a 10-minute uh, overview of the uh, magnetic field issue. 
And then, as Horam said, there'll be a whole nother hour. But in the end, to fully implement construction details, you'll have to need further, you know, diving into the details. And also, there's always the issue of individual constructions always comes up with some weird little issue, especially if you're doing remodeling. And, and we all know how fun it is with the weird things you can find in remodeling. And so here we have the magnetic fields, and that, that basic definition we're using here of magnetic fields is just the energization of space around and wherever there is electric current flow. And so we have magnetic fields whenever there is use of electricity, and so it's part and parcel of one and the same. You can't have electricity without magnetic fields, and every time there's magnetic fields, there's electricity someplace. <coughs> And so the issue is is not how to eliminate magnetic fields, but how to be able to use electricity and minimize uh, the, mag the resulting magnetic fields. Okay, and then also magnetic fields are, you are a result of the power production, the wiring issue, and then there are also all the devices that you have in your house which you use to carry information. And then electric fields are just something that exists whenever you just have the electrical system itself there, regardless of whether you're actually using anything. It's just the field itself. And then magnetic fields are caused when you're actually using things. And radio frequency is mainly for transferring information. And then smart technology, which gets along with what Frank is going to talk about, you know, the uh, the uh, dirty electricity issue is pretty much a combination of radio frequencies, electric fields, and magnetic fields in one big mess. And so another way we're going to go about this thing is to, uh, looking at the types of different sources. With this, this concept of three different types of sources also applies to all the other types of fields. But so I'm going to define these three categories and then give magnetic fields an example. And the three categories are self-action, meaning that you don't need a meter to tell you that that electrical device that's plugged into the wall sitting on your desk is you don't need a meter to tell you that that device is putting off some kind of electric, magnetic, or radio frequency. And so, and then you can take self-actions if you have control over it. You can turn it off. You can unplug it. You can distance yourself from it. So you can do self-action without meters. And the second source is you can't avoid. There's nothing you can do about it. And the third, which is applies mainly to these builders and contractors and architects, is this issue is you can reduce exposure caused by the building wiring itself, but you need to have meters in order to tell you what's going on, and you need expertise in those various fields to do something about it. On our next slide here. So this is a visualization of magnetic fields. And magnetic fields are always closed circles around wherever there's current flow. And so in this diagram, then, the yellow represents a wire. The red arrows represents the current flow in the wire. The black lines represent the intensity of the magnetic fields. So the wider the line, the, more the, str the stronger the magnetic field. And the purple arrows represent the instantaneous direction of the magnetic fields and the significance of the in, uh, instantaneous direction of the field is that if you have two fields overlapping each other, if the arrows are in the same direction, they add. If they're in opposite directions, they cancel each other. So what's shown in this diagram here in the space between these two wires going from a source out to a load and back to a source is in between the two wires, the magnetic fields cancel. And if we bring those two wires next to each other, you'll see that the arrows are in opposite direction. And so that's the whole objective of using uh, electricity with minimum magnetic fields is to verify that all the current that flows out one wire is 100% on the return wire that's right next to the wire going out. And then that's where the wiring errors comes in is, is that we can have issues in the simplest terms is the neutral is touching ground somewhere after the start of the service. And so then, therefore, you end up with current flow on the water pipes, on the freon lines, on the gas line, basically any metal in the house, you can have current flow on it. And whenever you have current flow, you get magnetic fields. And so the objective then for the build to addressing the building wiring issue is to 
make sure that all the wiring is absolutely perfect. And the only way you can verify that is you have to use clamp-on ammeters and clamp on to the wiring and verify that the current really is on the wiring and clamping on the water pipes and gas lines and everything else in the house and verifying that there's not current flowing on all those other all those other metal. All right, so now the next in here, so these are examples of the AC magnetic fields from devices. And so and basically anything that uses electricity is giving off magnetic fields. And because in the modern world, we keep using less and less electricity, so the magnetic corresponding magnetic fields go down. Just like in the old days, the computer monitors, you had the giant monitors or giant magnetic fields, and the flat screens are much less magnetic fields than the old-fashioned uh, monitors. And so we're getting less magnetic fields from all these di various devices. But the other problem is is that now everything has uh, radio frequency devices built into the devices. So nowadays it's hard for us to find something that just puts out magnetic fields only is, is that you end up with all the other uh, frequencies and radio frequency emissions from the, all these various devices. And then the other issue with these devices is the magnetic fields fall off quickly from uh, with distance, and so distance is one of the issue, one of the ways to address the exposure from these from these uh, devices. Okay, so then next is there, and so then this is your classic example of a magnetic field, an electric field, caused by something you have no control over. I have no idea. <laughs> why somebody would build a house there, but there it is. In fact, there's another in, in western Wisconsin, by La Crosse, Wisconsin, there's also a case of a 69 kV line that the poles are actually like two feet away from various houses. They just ran the, well, the power line was there first, and they built a housing development in the 60s directly underneath power lines. But we know just by looking at this, that there are magnetic fields coming off of these power lines because we have a separation of conductors that this conductor is a distance from this conductor, which is a distance from this conductor. And so since there's a separation of the conductors, you're going to get magnetic fields. And also, when these, these large transmission lines, we also have high current. Normally, you think of hearing that if you have a high voltage transmission line, the higher the voltage, the less amount of current. Well, it turns out with these high voltage lines, you could have 500 or 1,000 amps of current flowing on, the, on these transmission lines. And so there's very large magnetic fields over significant differences coming from transmission lines. And so there's no effective magnetic field shielding for this type of, of um, issue. And for electric fields, in theory, you could coat the house with metal roof and metal siding and ground it all, protect you from electric fields. But even if you did do such a thing, you would still have the, the uh, electric field, or you still have the magnetic field issue. So there's no, there's no real defense. So the only way we can tell these people's clients is, sorry, you know, there's no doing it. In fact, that's what I do now is whenever I get a client, call them up, the first thing I tell them, is, well, tell me your address, I'll go look at you from, you know, the Bing map or Google map, and if I see a transmission line right there, and it says, well, there's no sense in me coming out there and doing anything, no matter what you do, the big, your biggest source of field is, you know, is the, um, is the transmission line. And literally, I've had clients who go out there and they have a situation like this, and they said, yeah, when we bought the house, we didn't notice that transmission line, and, you know, well, so, Anyway, so then that's sort of the uh, brief uh, little introduction to magnetic fields. And then the objective of the whole one hour thing is not to give you everything there is to know about magnetic fields, but be able to be able to intelligently discuss all these issues with the various mitigators and to come up with details about what you want to be. Uh, the electricians and et cetera to do, and in the end, it's not an issue is the electricians don't have to understand magnetic fields. The electricians only have to have the right knowledge of exactly the way you wire it, which mainly means the issue of making it all code compliant. And the main difference between uh, what we're doing here 
And the regular things is, is that at the end, we want the electricians to get out mag or clamp on ammeters and clamp onto the metal and verify that the current is actually flowing on the wire, not flowing on all the other pieces of the metal, which, of course, if you're requiring electricians to do that, you actually, have, of course, have to pay them to do that. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the long and short of magnetic fields and wiring is make that wiring perfect. All right. Thanks, Bart. Who are we on to next? Uh, Orem again, electric fields. Uh, thank you. Uh, OK, so we're going to turn now to the uh, topic of electric fields. Um, this is a Spark's wrap-up uh, slide. And now we're going to go to AC electric field basics. Uh, they are produced by electric voltage. And that's measured with a voltmeter, not a gauss meter, similar to the pressure of water in a garden hose, not the flow of water. And they're really the unknown EMF, as I mentioned at the start of the uh, seminar, uh, because uh, people, because they are a, a different uh, facet of the uh, fields that come from electric uh, flow through and pressure uh, in a wire. The E is the electric field component. The M is the magnetic field component. They're right angles from each other. And they are uncoupled at the frequency of house wiring in the world at 50 or 60 hertz throughout the world. And yet the electric fields are the most common type of EMF. They're found in every bedroom, and they do affect your sleep, as we'll see. So the difference between magnetic and electric fields is the magnetic fields on the left are produced by the current flow of current, as Spark just said, whereas electric fields are produced by voltage. So if you look at the photograph at the bottom, obviously we have the flow of water through the hose. And we have, the uh, on the right-hand side, what I tell my clients is, Imagine the nozzle at the end there. If you turn on the spigot, it's like turning on the breaker uh, at the panel. You've now energized the circuit with 120 volts of pressure. And if you plug in a lamp, you've now added a length of hose. And when you turn on the spigot of the outdoor uh, water hose, you have 80 pounds of pressure up to the nozzle. When you squeeze that nozzle, now you have flow in addition to pressure. And you have flow because of the pressure. In the same way, when you turn on a light, when you have 120 volts of pressure because of the breaker being on, now the light bulb will light up because you've turned on the switch and closed that circuit. Now, when you let go of the nozzle of the hose, you feel the kick. Uh, you feel the pressure in your hand, right up to your hand, in that hose. In the same way, when you turn off the light, I tell my clients, you still have the pressure of 120 volts in the plastic lamp cord. And that emits a field into the room, six to eight feet, that affects you particularly when you sleep, but at all times of the day and night. Now, uh, so this uh, picture that you see in the upper right corner is something that most people don't think of. They say, well, I've got my bed away from the outlet, so I'm clear of the EMS. And what they don't realize is there's a wire that goes, a circuit, from outlet to outlet, uh, particularly Romex, uh, which is laid out horizontally here and 18 inches off the floor. So. The electric field comes from the Romex wire into the room, and that can affect the, the, your sleep. So it comes out six to eight feet from plastic jacketed Romex circuits, and also six to eight feet from unshielded AC power cords that, for instance, for your lamp there. And the field strength does decrease with distance, but it affects you when you sleep. Uh, and we can also have this uh, to great degrees from electric blankets, electric heating pads, and water bed heaters. Now, uh, there are ways of measuring this, but not with a Gauss meter. You measure them with either the, a body voltage meter on the left, those two meters there. They're basically multimeters set to volts AC, or handheld uh, electric field meters on the right. Uh, both of these are from Gigahertz Solutions from Germany. Uh, and they're sold by Safe Living Technologies in Ontario, Canada, and West EMF in New York. Now, if you see the diagram there at the top, these electric fields are coming from a lamp cord uh, and they're encompassing the space that the bed is located in. And most beds are located within six to eight feet of lamp cords and, and walls. And so the body voltage meter works in the following way. The, uh, the door handle or the cylinder that you plug into the multimeter is an antenna. And then you ground this either to the earth, to a stake in the earth, or to a ground prong uh, or outlet, uh, the ground hole in the outlet. And now that's the reference at the zero point. So when you hold on to that handle or cylinder, your body is an extension of the antenna, and you are the antenna now. So the numbers that we see on the screen under volts AC is the body voltage reading. 
So we have uh, standards in, uh, that we uh, say are safe in this country, uh, I'm sorry, in, in our profession, which are in, not in agreement with what industry and regulatory agencies say, but we'll get into that in our uh, more extended webinars on each uh, type of EMF. So the next slide here is showing what happens at night. You notice that this is eight hours of sleep, and during that time we go through these stages. So a, a particular cycle, a single cycle, would have a non-dreaming and dreaming part, the, the red and the blue. That's about 90 minutes. And you see that we're going through about four or five of these over eight hours. Now, during that time, during the non-dreaming part, our bodies go through these four stages where we go from shallow sleep to deep sleep and back again to shallow, and that's where you, when you dream, you're in shallow sleep. So the depth uh, of the sleep, the amount of time that you spend in stage four, determines how rested and refreshed you feel when you wake up in the morning. So all these things that I've listed here, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, sleep disorders, restless leg syndrome, allergies, hyperactivity, depression, headaches, they're all, they're all caused to a great degree by not being able to get into stage four sleep and having these electric fields in, in the bedroom. So again, this is the unknown EMF. And if you go to comments from clients on my website, createhealthyhomes.com, you'll see an abundance of people who have reported sleeping through the night, not awakening as often, feeling more refreshed. The kids don't fall asleep in class as often uh, from the mitigation work that we do in houses. So these are the improvements uh, on this slide here from getting deeper stages of stage four sleep, which is a natural phenomenon. You don't even need to take melatonin. We produce it from our pineal gland anyway, but that's been blocked by the presence of these electric fields. Now, this is what we can do uh, to help mitigate this. We want to create an electrically clean sleeping environment. Ideally, use flexible steel or aluminum metal clad um, flex or rigid conduit for all circuits. Uh, at least uh, have uh, this within six to eight feet around, above, and below each bed. And you want to have a shutoff switch for the outlets within that space because you can have the metal clad wiring but still have an outlet with a plastic cord plugged in and now you're back up again. Uh, in terms of electric fields. So we need that shutoff switch to kill the power in those uh, cords that you plug in near the bed. And then you want to reduce electric fields in daytime areas. Uh, you can rewire lamps and appliance cords uh, uh, with shielded AC power cords. So uh, in the Green Star Home Certification Program, these are the points that I selected that have to do with electric fields. Running, wire, uh, 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 running uh, your wire in metal conduit, uh, within six feet of the bed, run a metal conduit, ideally. Uh, electric wiring in the whole house can ideally be in metal uh, flex, and there are many good reasons to do that. And uh, at least provide a shutoff switch for all NM or Romex circuits within 10 feet of sleeping areas, and we'll discuss this in the longer webinar. So in summary here, you want to shut off Romex circuits uh, uh, with a contactor. For people who have existing homes, this is what I do. Uh, we bring an electrician in, and he puts in a Lutron or a contactor from Gigahertz Solutions or uh, Color Hammer, Square D. And then Lutron makes a Maestro and Pico remote switch so they can control that from the bedroom. Uh, if you have flex or uh, EMT in the walls that's metal clad, then you need a shutoff switch at the wall. In the short term, you can unplug your AC power cords and, and see that your sleep improves. You can you have a plug-in switch that I show here, uh, shielded power strips. You can rewire your lamps with mu cord, which is shown there at the bottom from less EMF. It's a shielded cord. Uh, avoid electric blankets and watch for the reverse polarity of the plug. I'll discuss that in more detail. Use battery operated clocks. Have your home professionally evaluated by one of us, uh, ideally. Uh, that's really a good thing to do. And for the daytime, uh, one example would be laptops that have two prong plugs. You're going to have high electric fields. You really want to use a three prong plug for that. So now I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Damon, and uh, I'll also come back in at the end of Damon's and introduce Frank, uh, Brett. So now it's on to Damon. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Damon Coyne. I'm happy uh, to be here and have the opportunity to share with you a bit about the issues related to radio frequency uh, radiation. Uh, this is a category of radiation it's received a lot of international attention in recent years as the research is really mounting and more and more people are becoming aware of electrosensitivities and health concerns. Since this is the type of electromagnetic field that they've heard more concerns about, it's often where, uh, where the awareness starts. 
There are dynamics with radio frequency. There's a lot of dynamics with radio frequency exposures. For one, most of the adolescents and adults in our society are carrying smartphones or tablets and have multiple two-way transmitters in them. Exposures to this type of radiation has exponentially increased in recent years with the trend of everything going wireless. As you heard Oram mention, Wi-Fi and other technologies are being removed from public buildings, schools, and organizations around the world. Many governments have reduced exposure standards because of the substantial amount of studies showing adverse effects. Because of the money involved with the industry that makes estimated $9 trillion annually, it's an estimated to make up to $15 trillion by 2020, uh, the wireless industry has a massive amount of influence. We, we didn't even hear that radio frequency was classified as a potential carcinogen in 2011 by the World, World Health Organization in our media, where that was a significant news story in, in a lot of Europe and other countries. So most of the wireless technologies now are using pulse radiation, and that's another issue uh, because it's been shown in research to be more biologically harmful than the analog AM and FM radio, uh, although that can be an issue too in terms of how close you are to uh, those towers. But another big issue with these uh, technologies that are wireless is that many of them are broadcasting all the time, whether or not people are using them. So it's a concern about chronic exposures uh, where you have pings and beacon signals of these two-way devices. These devices make themselves known to the main transmitters frequently, and it's a, they're set up differently. Some are uh, milliseconds, and some are uh, every so many seconds, and some are once an hour and once a day. So they really vary, and that's another issue with things like uh, smart meters and so forth. Um, here I get this slide. Though not everyone thinks they can feel this radiation, it doesn't mean that people aren't affected, and it's been a fascinating journey for me the last uh, 10 years and eight years more intensely working with this, is uh, seeing the difference people experience after the fields are reduced. Uh, when you're in it all the time, it's difficult for people to know what's contributing to stress in the body, but when we find uh, and many of our colleagues finding when people are reducing fields, they're often feeling much less agitated. The muscle tension reduces. The mental clarity and focus improves. Sleep improves. Headaches go away. And generally, people have more energy. As it applies to building, your considerations from choosing the location of the buildings in relation to the transmitters, to implementing strategies and the design process to minimize exposures, This is a chart with a lot of content, but it demonstrates how exposures to different field strengths of radio frequency correlate with detrimental health effects in studies and those threshold concerns. So basically, you have the strength of the field on the left-hand side of the slide there and the studies on the bottom. The red dots are where the studies show health effects, health effects, health effects, health effects that have been talking about microwatts per square meter on the, in terms of the strength. And along the right side are concern guidelines that are used by building biology. Uh, this graph was created to compare exposures from Wi-Fi access points. And some are much stronger now, but this was a Cisco router that was uh, rated here. But you're seeing like even as low as 0.001, we see the study showing DNA damage down at the bottom there with a failure to repair the DNA. And then blood brain, uh, brain tumors and blood brain, brain, excuse me, blood brain barrier issues, uh, allowing toxins to get into the brain tissue, which is a huge issue with conditions like Alzheimer's and ADD and autism and Parkinson's, uh, things like that, um, is at 10 microwatts per square meter in the middle there, where we're really trying to get people at least under that where they're sleeping and spending the most time. At the top, you're seeing that 10 million mark. That's really where the FCC 
has the maximum permitted exposure guidelines for short-term exposure, which is really based on uh, this mechanism of heating of tissue. And so that's like the microwave oven effect of a uh, device of uh, heating up at brain tissue. So uh, we see that there are thousands of studies that are showing biological effects far before you get to that point. Uh, for the Green uh, Home uh, Institute checklist or the, the Green Star certification list, uh, there are uh, this addresses many of the internal issues for radio frequency exposures uh, so that wireless components aren't needed within the space. So thinking through the data wiring in advance is a big key that can save a lot. Uh, I want to discuss the, the issue of external sources of radio frequency. Um, this is a graph showing symptoms reported in a surveyed study in Spain and basically proximity to cell phone antennas and the percentage of residents reporting symptoms there. So you get away from the towers, uh, these surveys are showing less of these types of symptoms. So here are some uh, tips for reducing radio frequencies. Uh, we have, uh, of course, talking about wiring everything so you don't really need the wireless. Uh, consider also placement for entertainment centers. <coughs> since uh, much of the media is going to streaming, uh, internet-based uh, media, and uh, considering for security systems and baby monitors and, and intercom systems is a great uh, thing to consider. Um, opting out of smart meters when possible, that's uh, uh, becoming more available in different states. We have a few states now that are offering free opt-out, I know in Minnesota. We've had uh, at least six municipalities within the Twin Cities that are uh, allowing people to opt out of those smart water meters. Uh, the, the electric meter issue is a bigger deal here. That hasn't happened yet, but uh, we're hoping for it. And, um, but there's also uh, the, the water meters are often a bigger deal within the basements than the, the ones that are set up for the electric meters on the outside of the house. Uh, but there's also different ways to shield for that. So um, uh, there is, to an extent, the dirty electricity is another issue there. Um, and then uh, considering the proximity to the cell phone antennas, uh, we see this is a you know basic rule of thumb. If you could see it or if it's with less than a half a mile, there might be a, a concern. If you can see it, there probably is an issue. This is a great source to check out, antennasearch.com, and you can put in an address and see uh, what are the antennas and the cell phone towers that are close to a property. And uh, that is a, a good source to see what's happening. Now, there are uh, many different uh, things that can be done. There, the type of building material makes a big difference in terms if it's a denser material, especially the mineral-based uh, cements like uh, magnesium oxide uh, materials and thicker wall materials uh, make a big difference in attenuating the signals. Uh, metal screens, often between 40 to 60 percent of the signals are cut by just uh, aluminum and steel screens instead of the vinyl ones. And then the shielding paints and the fabrics and uh, canopies and foils are all different factors. It's really important if you're going to be shielding to consider that you're not creating issues with reflections within the space. And that's why we really recommend having some support and measuring that with uh, good equipment and some experienced people that can support that. Um, but we have seen great uh, benefits from shielding with people that are sensitive and uh, it can be a highly effective solution. So thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to help educate about these important issues. So I'll pass it on back to you, or on to Frank. Thank you, Damon, Orm, Brett, and Spark. Dirty electricity, it's a real quagmire. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, dirty electricity 
is the least understood and hardest to mitigate of the four types of EMFs. Dirty electricity is a pollutant that flows along the wires and radiates from them. It can have both extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiation. There's a significant amount of evidence that points to dirty power as a reason for the adverse health effects from electric fields. Until recently, dirty electricity is largely being ignored by the scientific community, also the medical community. Electrical pollution is not something you can see, smell, taste, or touch. It is not something you can make sense, making it difficult for one to be aware of the presence of electrical pollution. With this in mind, it is important to understand what causes electrical pollution, what to look for in your everyday environment and home. 30 years ago or so, the electricity entering the home was relatively clean and free from extra frequencies and noise. Today, the electricity coming in is, is a distorted signal is not very clean at all. This is what's coming in from the power company. Public exposure electromagnetic EMF radiation has increased dramatically over the past 25 years. Dirty electricity in the electrical wiring has been linked to many serious diseases and health conditions, including cancer, multiple sclerosis, elevated blood sugar, obesity, migraine headaches, attention deficit orders, disorders, asthma, chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivity, miscarriages, infertility, depression, and suicide. Typically, the most common thing that somebody will experience is not being able to sleep, being irritated, being irritable, uh, headaches, migraines, uh, muscle aches and pains. That is typically the first things they'll feel when they're uh, being succumb to dirty electricity. The range of dirty electricity. A uh, typical frequency range of dirty electricity is between 800 hertz and 88 megahertz, which uh, 88 megahertz goes right up into the AM radio band. We have measured frequencies higher and lower on wiring and radiated off of electronic equipment. Uh, of course, again, we need specialized equipment to do this, spectrum analyzers and certain types of meters that are uh, designed to filter out the 60 cycle uh, component, which is the main uh, frequency of AC electricity coming in the United States, 50 cycles in Europe. Uh, these meters are used to help to find the, these uh, dirty electricity components of the AC signal. One of the problems associated with dirty electricity is that it can be found throughout the house wiring and get into, sen get into sensitive electronic equipment causing problems and even damage. The audio and computer industries are aware of this and have known this for many, many years because it interferes with the functioning of some of their electronic equipment and can cause audible hum, especially on speakers and high quality audio and video entertainment systems. Those industries typically try to take steps in reducing the amount of dirty electricity getting into their components, but that is not true of all products and services. Usually cost effectiveness dictates how clean a device will be. This is what a clean 60 cycle sine wave looks like. So at 120 volts, 60 cycles, and you had an instrument, an oscilloscope, to be able to look at this, at the uh, electricity coming from your wall outlet, this is what it should look like in general. Um, the power company sends that signal down to the wires on telephone poles and specialized scaffolding towers to substations for distribution to the homes and businesses. Uh, Spark had a picture of one of those towers next to a house. So this is typically what the signal would look like uh, coming down those wires and uh, not at 120. It's a much higher voltage, but in general, the wave should look like this nice and clean and fresh. This sensors the homes through the electrical meter and the main electrical panel. This is more like what you're seeing when you take a, uh, an oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer. Actually, a spectral analyzer will show it a little differently. Uh, 
you'll notice how it's distorted. This picture shows what dirty electricity wave looks like. Notice that it's not smooth and symmetrical like the previous waveform. The wave is distorted and jagged. A major source of dirty electricity is electronic devices that are in our homes and in our homes of our neighbors. Dirty electricity flows along the wires and can enter, our, your, enter your home from your neighbors through your electric panel and the copper water supply pipes. Dirty electricity can also be caused by arcing on the power lines during storms when lines touch trees and is also created from unfiltered cell phone and broadcast frequencies from nearby antennas. This slide is a picture of an oscilloscope showing a 60 side waveform and the dirty electricity which has been separated and otherwise known as uh, noise separated for the clarity so you can see what actually just the noise component looks like versus the waveform. That noise actually rides on top of the wave so it looks like it's all uh, combined. This noise is caused by high frequency voltages coming from our computers, printers, copiers, TVs, game consoles, tube fluorescent lighting, lighting, compact fluorescent light bulbs, dimmer light switches, variable speed motors, treadmills, vacuum cleaners, sewing machines, wind turbines, solar energy inverters, smart meters, and other electronic devices. Many modern electronic devices at high frequency transients or home electrical wiring. Much of this could be avoided if the products had stricter manufacturing requirements to prevent these devices from radiating these harmful frequencies in the first place. Um, certain computer industries, uh, the industrial computer sector or the uh, industri industrial slash military public service computer sector has very strict guidelines for this because of the sensitive equipment their, their devices will be uh, placed into, like in airplanes, um, in police cars, et cetera. So they're more prone not to be showing this type of, of uh, dirty electricity. But the general consumer products do not have that type of regulation. So what happens is they're, again, led by cost. And the cheaper that they can make a device, obviously, the the more uh, dirty it will be because they're cutting out uh, components that would be useful in filtering or keeping this dirty electricity at bay. Much of the noise gets onto and travels along the wires. Oh, I think I said that already. Uh, neighbors homes. Oh, most of the noise gets onto the travels onto the wires. So being in, all homes in the neighborhood are connected together by wires or telephone poles or buried underground as well as water, gas, and sewer pipes, which are metal in most cases. We can get dirty electricity from our adjacent neighbors' homes also. If a home is wired in Romax, plastic jacket of wiring, that where it can act as an antenna and broadcast most of those harmful frequencies, much like a radio transmitter. This means that when dirty electricity is on the wiring, it can be everywhere. Even if the home is wired in shielded wire, Dirty electricity can get on the grounding system and still be radiated everywhere. As Oren mentioned earlier, there's a magnetic field component that will go through the shielding also. So it's important to try to keep it out from the beginning. And it's important to note that dirty electricity, unlike radio waves, does not emit long distances from the devices that generate them, such as dinners, solar panel charge inverters. Instead, the harmonic frequencies ride on the circuits and the plastic appliance cords. So if you have a cord coming out of the outlet to a lamp, that can act as an antenna also to radiate it out further. And if that lamp is a, typically lamps have a metal uh, tube inside, that can act as an amplifier to uh, boost that dirty electricity and the electric fields coming off of it. This occurs because these circuits and wires are not fully shielded. This is true in metal clay wiring, which shields electric fields at all frequencies, but not mag magnetic fields below 1 megahertz. And most dirty electricity is below 1 megahertz. Thus, even if you have metal clad electrical wire, which protects you from 60 cycle electric fields, that interference with sleep, you can still have a magnetic field component from the dirty electricity that passes right through the metal cladding. 
You also have plastic AC appliance cords plugged into the outlets and rooms throughout the house. They can emit both electric, magnetic field components of these harmonic frequencies of dirty electricity when it exists. Some of the sources, common sources of dirty electricity. Many of these devices do not operate at the 120 volts that comes from the AC wall outlets. There are circuits inside these devices that change the voltage to a usable voltage that devices need to operate correctly. Much of the problem is with switched mode power supplies, or SMPS for short, is that they reduce the voltage and convert from AC to DC by squaring off and distorting an otherwise smooth sine wave of 60 hertz AC electricity. This produces harmonics of dirty electricity as a side effect. These harmonics then radiate off the circuits in your walls running throughout the house and from your AC power cords that you plug into the outlets. Any lamps and unshielded cords running through them can act as an amplifier and radiate these frequencies even further. Uh, computers, uh, televisions, video games, stereo equipment, some, uh, some printers and scanners now have what's called as a standby mode so that when you turn these devices off, they're actually not fully off and that the power supply in them, which causes this dirty electricity, is still on and operating so that it's ready to be energized uh, as soon as you uh, hit the on button or the remote. So even when you have devices like this, where you think they're off, they could still be radiating dirty electricity out of them. These are harmonics, again, even travel to un incoming power supplies from the dimmer switches, CFLs, and other sources of dirty electricity from your neighbor's homes moving from house to house. So because we're all connected through the grid and through the water and sewer pipes, all this can get everywhere on a house. So it's important to make sure that when the house is wired and set up electrically and mechanically with the plumbing that steps are taken to prevent this from getting into the house. Usually, manufacturers put only a barely adequate power supply to operate the device. Again, the cost of producing goods usually outweighs the potential side effects. And these are some meters, simple meters that can be purchased to uh, find dirty electricity. The one on the right is a green wave meter. Uh, the top uh, top left one is a Stetzer filter, and the, the bottom right is a Nevis, N-E-V-V-U-S. Um, these are not available, but I still show it because you can find them from time and time. Basically, it's a specialized voltmeter that has been modified to allow you to see just the elect dirty electricity bands. And some simple methods to reduce your exposure to dirty electricity, eliminate minimizing the use of these devices in your home, replace dimmer switches with on-off switches, replace CFLs with traditional light bulbs or LED bulbs, LED bulbs with improved power supply, replace smart utility meters with an analog meter, eliminate minimize use of device susceptible to being equipped with a switch mode power supply. Uh, possible benefits of reducing exposure to dirty electricity, research studies and anecdotal evidence suggest that reducing le dirty electricity in homes, schools and businesses and other settings may help improve the health of individuals who suffer from some diseases, i.e. diabetes, multiple sclerosis, for example, and may release symptoms common associated with dirty electricity exposure. Many people have taken concrete steps to reduce dirty electricity in their environment, report better health as a result of their efforts. There are some common improvements reported. Fewer headaches, more restful sleep, more energy, improved concentration, clearer thinking, less anxiety and irritability, fewer asthma symptoms, fewer sinus problems, fewer skin-related problems, rashes, flushes, tingling, burning, fewer digestive issues. Some diabetics require less insulin, at, less insulin after reducing dirty electricity in their environment. And to the green home checklist, we're citing 11B-15, install alternative, 
to electronic dimmer light switches, e.g. on-off switch or a three-way bulb that operates from 50 to 100 to 150 watts. And Brett, you can take this over and give it to Orem. Thanks, Rick. So Orm, thank you. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, all the panelists, uh, for uh, giving a very uh, concise and, and thorough uh, review of each of the types of EMF. And this is just an introduction uh, for those of you who are watching and listening. We're going to go into much greater detail uh, in the one-hour presentations that each of us will have covering each of these types. Before we take questions, let me give a very quick recap. Uh, for the basics here, the flow of current produces magnetic fields. The pressure of voltage produces electric fields. They're different from each other. EMFs are found at various frequencies, and they always have those two components. They're either uncoupled or coupled. Meters and instruments need to be used to detect these, and um, they are uh, uh, we use them as detectors. Uh, then uh, the uh, and Brett, if you can give me the uh, the ability to move the slides for just a moment here, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, EMS can cause health problems. We just got into that, uh, but uh, frankly, went into it in great detail. All of us did, actually, and and people need to realize um, the architects and builders and people listening to this uh, webinar need to understand that many and your clients need to understand that many of the health symptoms that they have are can be due to these uh, fields, but they don't know it. Or they don't hear about it in the news or uh, from academia or from the government regulatory agencies, but people in Europe do and Israel and Russia and Australia. They're taking Wi-Fi out of schools and, and hospitals in all of those countries. Uh, finally, design of your home and office really should avoid EMFs in the first place. Um, then for magnetic fields, we want to keep current on the intended path. That means insulated hot neutral conductors within circuits, the hot, those two conductors only. We want to keep current off the grounding path. That could be the water pipes, metal water pipes, TV cable sheathing. Uh, then you want to check for wiring errors prior to occupancy. Avoid proximity to point sources of magnetic fields, the, the panel, the meter, uh, the refrigerator, transformers, digital clocks in front of a, a stove because there's a transformer there. And don't build on property the near power lines, as Spark mentioned. For electric fields, uh, in, in general, ideally, if you can, use uh, flex or EMT metal clad conduit in and around bedrooms. You want a shutoff switch for the outlets uh, within uh, six to eight feet of the bed when you use flex or EMT. If you use Romex circuits, then you want a remote switch in the bedroom. Uh, uh, there are a number of ways to do that for the, the circuits that are involved, and we can identify that ahead of time. Uh, you want to rewire lamps with shielded cord, uh, particularly for the lamp, the table lamp or floor lamp near a, uh, a chair that you sit at uh, on your desk or uh, to watch TV. Uh, at, at your desk, move unshielded cords away from your body. Uh, that helps a great deal to maintain your energy during the day uh, when you sit there. And then three-pronged grounded AC power cords for laptops. Then for radio frequencies, reduce use, increase distance, favor hardwired connections for internet, telephone, media, TVs and such, security systems, speakers, thermostat, intercom, baby monitors. They're all going wireless now, and, and it's, it's, it's not a good thing health symptoms are increasing uh, concomitant with the deployment of these wireless uh, uh, networks and devices. Opt out of smart meters uh, for all the utilities, electric, uh, water, and gas when possible, or use shielding when necessary. Try and um, not live within a half mile to three quarters of a mile from cell towers. That's not always easy. Uh, and you can shield, uh, but it gets expensive, but it can be done. For dirty electricity, as Frank just said, Replace CFLs, for instance, with traditional light bulbs or LEDs. Uh, prefer straight on-off switches to dimmers, and we can go into that in more detail in his talk. Central control systems like Lutron and Crestron are more clean than off-the-shelf dimmers. They have to be to avoid the, the hum that these customers will hear in their audio systems. And avoid uh, variable speed HVAC motors, so the electrically common unit variable speed motors. Uh, they cause dirty electricity. And replace smart meter uh, utility meters with analog meters when possible. So um, these are our websites. Um, and then the website for the Building Biology Institute is at the bottom. You can go there on the home page on the right and click on a building biologist near you, find an expert, to find someone in your area around the US and Canada. 
And we also invite uh, any of you to uh, join us and take the training programs that we offer, not just at EMS, but also indoor air quality and natural building materials. Go to the website HBELC and click on certificate uh, certification programs and the seminars to learn more. So at this point, I'll open the floor to questions, and Brett, I'll give it back to you. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everybody. We did go over a little bit of time here, but uh, we got a lot of questions, so stick around. we got about 15 minutes. We can do a little bit of Q&A here um, just to get the, some of your questions answered. So the first one coming in here from Paul, um, and that, maybe these are one of the recommendations in the Green Star checklist, uh, and if not, it should be. But uh, what is the minimum safe distance from high voltage transmission lines um, for locating a house? And, and I can help uh, direct these. Uh, Spark, that would be in your bailiwick uh, for magnetic fields. And you'll have to unmute us for this. Uh, yep, uh, there we go. I'm back online. Well, in the uh, deal with the distance from transmission lines is, is that we'd like to see, you know, the 500 feet and et cetera. Certainly not back to the house we saw in the picture. But in general, what happens is you get further away from transmission lines and all the stuff you're doing in your house ends up being larger than what you get from the transmission lines. You know, of course, if you get the giant you know, three three forty five KV lines and etc. Other, you know, the higher the voltage is, the further away you want to be from it. But, but we're not. I'm not into a specific distance. Just the, the further the way, the better. And the higher the voltage, the further away you want to be. And, and we also tell our clients um, that you know it's important to get a Gauss meter and, and to measure them. You can use a data logging Gauss meter. Uh, um, we've done that, um, and you'll see the fluctuation from day to night. The most the highest use is actually in the evening when everyone comes home and turns on all their devices. The lowest uh, time is the nighttime when everyone's sleeping and has most things off. It also increases in the summertime when people run air conditioning. So it, it, it will vary. Um, another question on that note, um, is it just, I guess from a society standpoint, um, would it be better that the, the power cable be buried underground? Would that make any difference? Spark? Yep. Well, the deal, the difference between it from in terms of electromagnetic exposure, whether uh, overhead versus underground, I think we're talking specifically about the service drop going from the transformer over to the house. Yeah, and well, so like the power lines from house to house, you know, along the utility lines. Yeah, I mean that's a utility issue. But but the main difference in the overhead and underground is with underground, there's no electric fields. And it'd be overhead, so especially you run the, the apartment buildings that are, you know, on a back alley in a power line running down the alley and get really high electric fields. But the other issue uh, with it, I'm talking about the service drops now, is to verify that the current on those wires is actually all the current on the wires and not flowing elsewhere. And the power lines coming into your house can be part of that errant wiring path. And again, a lot of this stuff is a whole lot easier when we get to having the schematics, what we're going to do in the one-hour sessions. But, but, but basically, all, underground will protect you from all the electric fields, but you still could have magnetic field issues if you have, still have that wiring air issue. And, and, and Spark makes a good point. Um, the, the, the wires ha are separated up on the utility poles because they're not insulated. And they do that to save money and because they say that the high amount of current causes heat, which burns up the insulation. So when um, the local EMF consultant for Southern California Edison came out, and I, I met that person at a client's house, I said, well, what do you do about the heat when you put these things underground? She said, well, they are insulated uh, so they can be close together, but we put them in oil. There's a special paper that surrounds them, uh, and, and that dissipates the heat, and now they use aluminum paste. So. Um, but but you, when you bear when you put them together underground, you do take away this uh, the magnetic field that you get from lack of cancellation when it's overhead. But as Spark said, that doesn't guarantee that it will completely eliminate the magnetic fields because you can have the, the customer pay to put them underground, and the customer pays for it, not the utility. But people have done that for aesthetic reasons. But they don't get rid of the magnetic field completely because you have the unbalanced loads between the hot and the neutral because of current going on the parallel paths, like the water main. And Spark will get into that. So I should turn it over to other questions. And, and you might want to unmute Damon and Frank as well, because they may have comments to make as well. Brett. Great, thanks. Um, Great, so thanks. Moving, um, moving on to moving, the... Moving on to the... 
I'm getting some feedback here, guys. So I'm going to feedback here, guys. So I'm going to have to ask one of you guys to shut your ask one of you guys to shut your out there. Uh, moving on to inside the house, uh, when we're building a new home or doing major renovation that does change the electrical wiring, um, is it better to run house wiring through conduit? Well, I can feel that. Um, so it depends. First of all, it's very important for the people on this call to, and viewers of the webinar of this webinar to understand that conduit, metal conduit, does not prevent magnetic fields. You prevent magnetic fields by having balanced loads between the hot and the neutral and having the hot and neutral together in the same path, which, by the way, in other countries, you can have the neutral in another path, like in Mexico. Hot over here, neutral over there. That's allowed. But in this country, they, they have to be together. And the code says that, by the way, but it's not enforced. And they, then so the, the hot and neutral need to be together, and the current on the hot and neutral needs to be the same. Uh, now, as far as uh, the difference in uh, cladding, metal versus um, plastic, that's to reduce electric fields, which is interesting because that's a nighttime issue as far as we're concerned. It does affect the depth and quality of sleep, as I mentioned. But for daytime use, most healthy people can tolerate um, the electric fields that are present in a house wired with Romex. Electrically sensitive people have trouble with that. And so if they're lucky enough to be in Chicago or New York where all the um, wiring is, is EMT, it's all pipe, metal tubing. And here in Southern California, there's a lot of flex from the 70s and 60s from the era where they did that for earthquake protection. Um, Beverly Hills only allows flex. Uh, um, as an example. So in the daytime, uh, you can tolerate the Romex. Um, so it really comes to, to these issues. But, but if for electric fields, that's what you would use the metal cloud wiring for. If you can afford it, it's a better choice for, to use flex. Uh, you can run new wiring through it. it, it doesn't, uh, you can't drive a nail through it like you can through NM or Romex wiring. Uh, it can sustain uh, earthquakes better. So there are many advantages to having a metal clad wiring. Um, now, back on to protection from uh, exterior EMF threats, uh, what are some of the good ways to shield the outside EMFs and the exterior the walls EMFs of a house? The exterior walls of a house? For example, wire mesh For example, or wire mesh concrete wall. Or concrete Damon, wall. Can you, Damon, can you turn your speaker down? Uh, yeah, because this, uh, yeah. this, this is for you. This is for you. Your question. Okay. Yeah, um, there's there's various ways to work with uh, shielding outside sources of uh, radio frequency. The, the as I mentioned before, the density of the building materials really make a big difference. So you're either using um, you know masonry, uh, brick, uh, great products like uh, Duracell and fast fast wall, the insulated concrete uh, forms uh, can can help uh, the. You can also use lime plasters, Venetian plasters, you know, marble dust. The denser the material, uh, the more the better it will shield as far as all the natural, more natural materials. Also doing multiple layers of uh, magnesium oxide boards, like Dragon Board, Jet Board, Magnum products, they, um, they, they can be used for sheathing and siding and, and replacement for sheetrock. So those are ways, but depending, it's relative to how strong the source of the radiation is. If the cell phone tower or uh, antenna is uh, close enough and it's measuring strong, then you're you're more leaning towards adding with the the shielding paints and uh, and films. You have to be careful about vapor permeability if you're using foils and su such, so because uh, we don't want to create issues with trapping moisture and mold. So it's a balancing act around that kind of stuff. But um, those are some good uh, things to do. It, 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 the paints also are interesting because they, they're, they're uh, carbon graphite, a conductive material. I saw somebody else mention about using rubber. Uh, the rubber is not going to shield uh, radio frequency. Um, it has to be a conductive surface or the density of uh, more of a masonry or mineral-based uh, material. But the thing about the paints is you can also ground the paints and you're you could help shield electric fields like the metal conduit does. So that brings in what Orem was talking about. So there's a lot of different options, but you just look at what's the situation and what's the relative sources. Thanks, Damon. Um, Thanks, Damon. Another. Um, another 
meet you there real quick. Thank you there real quick. Thanks. Uh, another question that came in, um, specifically uh, regarding electrical baseboard heaters, um, from an EF, EMF standpoint, is that a uh, bad idea? That would be for he, uh, spark. It's a magnetic field issue. Um, I guess he's talking here about uh, hardwired 240 volt. Uh, well, I don't want spark. Well, if you're if it's 240 volts, then you don't have the electric field issues because the the you know the plus 120 cancels the negative 120. And and since in the wire, presumably the wire is running from one end of the you know along a heater and then circles back around to complete the circuit, you're not going to have zero distance between the wires, and so there are going to be some magnetic fields from the from the devices. So well, you wouldn't want that heater right next to your bed anyway for the fire issue. But, but it drops off it, pretty quickly within yeah. three, four feet. Yeah, I mean, it can be distant, but we still we like the idea of distance from them. And the, well, I guess the only other thing as to whether this electric heat has some kind of uh, light dimmer technology in order to vary the temperature. Hmm. So, now, I, mean, I haven't looked a lot close to see whether they do it, but certainly it would be possible that you could get electric noise if they're if you have a temperature dial on there that so you can pick any temperature you want in there. So the ideal way if you're gonna have a thermostat on there is the old style thermostat that it either turns it all on or turns it all off and does do all kinds of other temperatures in between. Now another point is the building biology profession in general recommends um, hydronic heat, you know, uh, hot water uh, yep. through pack, uh, Aquapex and, you know, Wearsbo and that sort of thing. But something else I want to point out there are three manufacturers that I know of for in-floor base or uh, in-floor uh, radiant electric heat: uh, SunTouch, InnoTherm, and Danfoss. Uh, and uh, what they have is what they call dual technology, dual conductor technology, where they instead of running uh, the hot out and going zigzagging back and forth, and then running the neutral or the end of it back along one wire, uh, one wire along one side, where you have zero cancellation and a high magnetic field. They figured out that if they run the hot out all the way to the end and then circle it back, so the return wire is right alongside the outgoing wire at all places, then, as you've learned earlier t today, the field, the magnetic fields cancel each other. But then they also put shielding on the 120 volt elements in the floor. And I remember going, I spoke, I gave a, an EMF lecture at the uh, Minnesota chapter, the American Institute of Architects uh, annual meeting. And they have a pretty big vendor uh, uh, section. And I was going up and down the aisles um, uh, talking to people. And I met the folks from one of those companies. And I said, uh, everyone knows about magnetic fields, at least you know who's into this. But, but you, you know about electric fields as well. How do you know about 120 volt electric fields being an EMF problem and shielding it with uh, grounded shielding? And he said, we do our homework. So you know, I really credit them for that. Uh, and they advertise that on their websites that that, the, that they have reduced EMF. So good for them. We got time for this one last question here before we wrap up. Um, now we can stick around, as you mentioned, Brett. By the way, um, it, you know, after the recording has ended. Sure, sure. Yeah, we can have you guys stick around. Not a problem at all. Um, I just have to get this uh, session wrapped up from my end, but uh, we should be able to keep this thing on. Um, as long as people want to discuss it. So um, the last question that we'll have before we uh, uh, close the, the recording here, um, how often should whole house search suppressors be replaced? Does this reduce the amount of electromagnetic interference? Uh, let's have Frank answer that. Frank? Well, hello. Yeah, you're on, Frank. Whole house search suppressors. I don't know if there's actually a time limit on a whole house surge suppressor if it's not being tripped. So the surge suppressor, yeah. if it's operating correctly, should be fine. As far as I'm aware, Spark, what do you have to say well, about that? Well, there is, there is a technology, MOV protectors, and every time they get hit with a surge, it does just, you know, it does eat the device up itself. But so, as far as well, it I mean, reducing, it, yeah, go ahead. Well, sorry, reducing electromagnetic 
interference. Well, that well, that's you know that would be an interesting question. Actually, actually that's what we're doing it over on that PV and noise issue. We're going to be doing some experiments to see what these all these surge protectors do. Again, it would be so nice, to, be nice to, uh, to do actual experiments and test these various things with the noises that we're concerned about, and we're in the process of doing that research. There you go. All right, everybody. Well, we're going to wrap up here, and I am super thankful to Orm Miller, um, uh, Frank Damon, and Spark here getting together and putting this session on for us. It's been a long time, um, but I appreciate everyone's time. We're going to be doing more in-depth sessions on each of the four um, EMF uh, sections, if you will, and diving in a little bit into those um, as we go throughout the next year. Uh, this session is recorded. You can access it later for those of you listening live and want to get your continuing ed. Stick around here for a second. A survey will also be sent to each of you for those listening on demand. Uh, take your uh, yeah. webinar quiz associated with this here yeah, at the end. So. Thanks again for everybody's time here, and um, I appreciate everything that you guys have done. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, close down now. So thank you. Now, now, Brad, if if people want to.